Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, Hum by Verizon, RockAuto.com, State Farm, and AutoTempest.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. And thank you, Alec Webb. Welcome to Motor Week, podcast number 178. I'm John Davis, and joining me here around our table in Studio C is writer-producer Brian Robinson. What's up, John? Road test producer Ben Davis. Back at you, John. Assistant road test producer Greg Carlos. Hello. Our over-the-edge reporter, Zach Maskell. Hey, John. Has granted us his attendance. Thank, thank you, Zach. You nice to you have much. you with us. Appreciate it. Okay, no, we've you. got a lightning round. A viewer question. We're going to hear from Zach in just a few minutes, too. Um, a rat and rave, maybe. Zach? Was, I got one. Uh, you got one? Yeah, okay, we got a couple around the table. That's good. <laughs> good. Surprise. First, <laughs> let's hop on to some of the vehicles that we've been testing lately and been to previews for. for um, we just had in a pair of Cadillacs, and don't everybody go to sleep on us right, right now. Uh, their big car, their current flagship called the CT6, both cars that we had in, each one had a different high-tech feature. Wow. One was a, a plug-in hybrid. It's actually uh, the only uh, Cadillac right at the moment that's being imported from China. And the other was a CT6 with their new semi-autonomous driving system called Super Cruise. Um, we can take them both together separately. Uh, any comments about these two vehicles? We want to start with the, uh, the plug-in hybrid. Uh, yeah, because I didn't really spend much time with the Super Cruise, so I'll talk about the um, plug-in hybrid. Uh, a couple of things. It's actually a fairly large battery compared to, like, the German luxury mm -hmm. plug-ins. You get over 30 miles of uh, electric range in it. Uh, seamless in the way it worked, I thought. Um, and I was just in a CT6 uh, this morning. And uh, I forgot how it is a very luxurious car, and it's very everything about it is very techy, almost like what Ac Acura was going for, right. you know, uh, ten fifteen years ago. That seamless blend of luxury and technology. I think they definitely pulled that off. The interesting thing, uh, while I was over at the Cadillac dealership, uh, I was talking to the uh, sales manager about the plug-in. He said he has not ordered one, and doesn't have plans on ordering one, unless someone comes in with money begging for one, because he sees like no. No market for one. So that's neither here nor there. But anyway, that's I don't. I think we've actually <laughs> heard the same thing from uh, Mercedes dealers as well that yeah. they have not had much success selling their PHEVs. And I think part of the problem is in this country, um, it seems like a lot of premium uh, to pay for you know thirty miles worth of electric range and gas is cheap. In Europe, everybody's gearing up for these, and in China too because they're anticipating more and more cities basically saying you can't drive an internal combustion engine into the city during certain hours of the day, if at all. And as mentioned, it is built in China, mm -hmm. so it's really for their market more than ours. Yeah. But. Any other uh, comment? No. I'm definitely not surprised to hear what you just said, Brian. I mean, that was actually going to be one of my questions was kind of, you know, what's the market looking like for this? vehicle and what are they expecting so um that's not really surprising to me i, I think know. with the exception of something like a um a chevy volt um there the ph the plug-in hybrids just have not done well even toyota hasn't done well with uh with their phev prius i don't believe huh. on the other hand we also had a ct6 in here with super cruise and we've been hearing about gm's answer to autonomous driving for about three years what Super Cruise is, it's both less and more than a lot of the other semi-autonomous systems. Super Cruise is a system that works only if the highway has been pre-programmed into the car, meaning it's a four-lane, limited-access, interstate-type highway. And if it is, and the car tells its, can tell by GPS it's on that road, you can take your hands off the steering wheel and you can literally put them in your lap or fiddle with your phone as long as you don't look down too much. There is an infrared camera that's watching your eyesight. It wants to know you're still pretty much looking ahead. And if you start looking down too much or having a conversation with someone else and looking away from the road, lights start going off and the system will deactivate. But for if you're looking for a system that, like regular cruise control, 
gives you a break on the road where it's not just your foot is resting but your hands as well, uh, it seems to work very well. I drove about 75 miles uh, with my hands in my lap. Uh, it gets a little boring after a while, uh, and it works pretty well. It it kind of gets close to corners a little bit. Uh, so I think it's an interesting system. At least you weren't having to put your hands back on the steering wheel every 30 so seconds. So you said if you're not looking up, then it sh- it shuts off. If like, you, what do you are mean looking, by, if what you've you mean got, by shuts off? If you, like if you're heading towards a corner, it disengages, and now you're going straight off the road or what? No, it starts, yeah. well, it starts as a green light at the top of the steering wheel. Uh, it starts flashing. There's other lights that flash. It's giving you a warning that basically you need to start paying attention. If you raise your head up, start looking ahead again, everything goes back to normal. If you ignore it, it will eventually shut down, pull off to the side of the road and shut down. Oh, it pulls off to the side of the road and shuts down. I actually didn't have it do that, but that's what they said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just expecting you know, it to turn off. and tells you to get out of the car. No, and no, no, takes no. Off it doesn't you. just leave you stranded on the In true Cadillac fashion, it will rumble your seat bottom and stuff. So yeah. it's pretty alarming pretty quick. I remember when we had it in, the roads were extremely salty, and it took me a while to get it to engage. Yes, that's correct. But when it did, it did do it easily, and it was... Amazing. I think we have to put it in context to all the other systems. It, it doesn't avoid construction. If there's something, if they're building, doing con- construction in the right-hand lane, it's not going to automatically move around it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't automatically pass in any way, shape, or form. It's what it is. It's cruise control without your hands on the steering wheel. Now, is that better or worse than the other autonomous systems where you've got to have your hands hovering near the wheel or resting on the wheel, which I find even more annoying than, than this. It takes more attention. Yeah. Yeah, that is annoying. I think, what was it I said, Brian, when I was telling you about when I went out and drove it? I was, I was less, I was almost not afraid to use it, mm-hmm. something like that. So fun. say if you have like 10 miles of range and you engage it, and will it just let you drive and run out of gas? <laughs> That's I, I would fun. assume I so. Why I, <laughs> I don't think that has anything to do with it. I do think the uh, LED readout in the steering wheel that uh, gives you the status of the system probably should become standard or, mm. or the, you know, the trade the trade, uh, whatever word I'm looking for. It should be what everybody – yeah. It was, it, is, it, was, it was right there. there. It was it, foolproof, and it's right there. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to look at nothing on the dash to, to pop up. You can't put those leather wraps around the steering wheel, though. So, oh, dude, I didn't think about that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you found fuzzy, a fault with Or the fuzzy ones. That was even better. <laughs> or you could start a market for them now, just with the cutout. <laughs> there was an, a AAA survey uh, that came out recently that said that uh, compared to two years ago – Two years ago, 78% of the drivers said that they were not interested in riding in a vehicle that drove itself. That number is now apparently 63%, so there's been some improvement. And the researchers liken that to the fact that people are starting to get used to some of the features like automatic braking and lane keep assist and stuff like that. So they're they're slowly warming to the idea. But uh, I'm, I guess I'm still not sold that where we are with this technology makes a lot of sense at the moment. I don't want to drive an autonomous car, but I want everyone else on the road driving one. Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Well, Porsche will never make one, so you're they, 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 already, oh, yeah. they already have the Inno drive right? in yeah, Europe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think everybody's – I heard again, somebody say they would never. Yeah. It's just like electric vehicles. Everybody feels like they've got to do it or get left behind. I always turn off lane keep assist in every car I drive. It's the most annoying thing. Ever yeah, invented. It's the worst. I like the automatic braking function because that basically oh, yeah. can it keeps you from being a total idiot. I've had a couple times though where I'm coming around, you know, a turn. There's oh, a car around the turn, and it stops, yeah. flash, and freaks me out. Yeah. And I'm just cruising. And I know what I'm doing, and then it just I, goes off and randomly brakes. I mean, it's almost that function's almost caused a couple accidents. I actually had to turn it off at least collision warning in the XF sport brake yeah. because it was too Fingers sensitive. All the time. Too sensitive. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. You couldn't get near a car with it without it going off. Durango saved me yesterday uh, coming. I know this isn't going to make any sense to listeners, but 140 <laughs> and 491 crosses. Mm-hmm. I'm heading towards the beltway. You know, somebody yeah. takes a, a left. Somebody oh, no. comes down to the brakes to take a left on 91 instead of going through the shopping center to do it. Oh, uh, yeah. And, you know, just Holy all smoke. of the traffic. That's no left turn, and there's a median and everything and else. people are they, going 60 miles uh, an hour. Yeah. Oh. 
it brought me down. I where bet it did. Quick, and that's, I mean, just that's that split second where I wasn't paying the uh, adequate what attention it's for, for that. You weren't doing anything wrong. I mean, you were paying attention. Yeah. And just, that, and somebody did something yeah, totally somebody stupid. Else. And they did it right in the middle of. They didn't stop right where that light is. Right. They're, I mean, they're out in the middle, so. Everybody Should have got his license plate number, traffic. and Robinson would have mandated that guy goes uh, autonomous his it whole was. life. Good times, but thank, <laughs> I, I'm thankful for I was in that car at that time. There you go. I'd vote for you if that was ever a position. Really? Basically, you, you, monitor, you police <laughs> which people are. need to be. <laughs> All right, let's get back on track here. Yeah, no, really. no political it's campaigns. Silent majority. Uh, 2018 Ram 1500. <laughs> Zach, you went on the preview. The most new uh, Ram truck in uh, decades. Scottsdale, 19? Arizona. It was oh. nice to get some sun. I have a vitamin D deficiency, so that was pretty sweet. All new truck, new frame. Uh, the Ram shares all the underlyings with it as well. Um, it hauls more, it gets better fuel economy. The biggest news is that in the limited version, it's got this big 12-inch uh, touchscreen. It was really nice. It worked pretty well for us. Um, you know, it's got four more inches of room, so, like, the rear leg room is insane. I mean, you could have a party back there. I'll be um, the judge of that. <laughs> give it a shot, man. And then this e-torque is the newest thing. Explain the uh, – Yeah, I was curious yeah. about so that myself. They're calling it a mild hybrid. We it's didn't a 48 drive volt these trucks electrical there. Electrical system. 48 volt electrical system. Basically, what they did was they replaced the alternator with this belt driven um, motor slash generator. And what that does is, you know, this is optional, I believe, on. Optional on, on the eight, standard on the six. Right. And um, it adds 130 pound feet to the 5.7 liter. Um, and. Beef. Yeah, I mean, sweet. I wish we could have driven it. It was yeah. pretty cool. But. The uh, the what they're after here is all of the truck manufacturers are determined to get the fuel economy crown. Yeah. At a time where most people don't seem to be caring that much about fuel economy, trucks, I think uh, owners apparently are caring. So they're using that, and and of course everybody's trying to do diesels. So it's a, a fuel economy thing. But more importantly, that forty eight volts is going to open that new chassis up to a lot of, of new technology that basically twelve volts won't allow it. So I think it's pretty. That's a very bold move for them. GM had a similar system. Yes, it did. There, the right? GM yeah. mild yeah. hybrid yeah. systems yeah. that were on Chevys and so forth. Basically the same thing, a, a supersized motor mm-hmm. replacing the alternator. Yeah. It was not, but that was not married with a 48-volt electrical system for the whole vehicle. Right, right, right. Uh, and it didn't go over very well. So I don't think they'll sell the vehicle based on the fuel economy that system will deliver at this point. But it opens themselves up to a lot of new technology. And they, they do still have the diesel or they don't? Uh, the V6. Yeah. yeah. The three yeah, they still do. Yeah. There, uh, it's interesting at the auto at the Detroit Auto Show, both the new Ram and the new Silverado were shown. The Silverado, in my opinion, has a lot more uh, technical features that are kind of like eye popping, and it's a newer way to do a truck in some ways. But I have to tell you, the rank and file all went for the Ram, largely because of the interior. Not just the touchscreen, but they just thought it looked so much richer. Did you think the interior really looked that nice? In I wasn't as wild as, you know, kind of what you told me yeah. everybody else seemed to be. They went crazy. I mean, it. the truck, it was a nice truck, don't get me wrong, but I I wasn't very excited about it, to be honest with you. Uh, it drove really, really nice. Um, and, you know, it's kind of what I expected for this Ram to be. It did meet my expectations, but it wasn't mind-blowing. Hmm. So I mean, the interior is really nice. I mean, it's cool in the uh, the, in the Longhorn version. You know, they made it a point to let us know that in like the wood dash, it's uh, it's branded for each truck. It's really branded. In you mean there. it's That's really cool. branded? Yeah, okay. in the woods. <laughs> Who gets that job? What's, what's branded into the woods? It's like they they brand like Laramie Longhorn. So it's burned in. And in, yeah, hmm. into the dash on the wood. Okay. Um, Saves I mean, me from having to do it. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's how many configurations that you can get in this truck? There's six trim <laughs> levels, and then there's like thirty different you know configurations you can choose from or whatnot. So that's the I mean, with pickup trucks. Some of the yeah, and I mean some of the some of the interiors were really really nice. I definitely liked um, a couple of the you know colors that they set out to get, like the um, sunrise or sunrise color that they put in and this and that, but. 
Did, um, That's so funny. I'm sorry. Yeah. What are you laughing about? It sees me from having to do it. Like you would have done it. If you had a wood the head that was a joke. I'm just going to give him one of those little wood GC, pencils that baby. you get. You know, that we yeah, can, can you get it personalized? Scroll I into, would pay extra for that, that if they would personalize that was the brand. Just we'll go write him a letter. Brands, whatever dash Call you have. Get him on the phone right now. Get him on a horn. Get him on the horn. Did you get to drive the Rebel? Yeah, we drove the Rebel off-road. Um, is it more than the Rebel was before? The Rebel before was pretty much just a trim kit. So it costs less this year, hmm. uh, but it's very similar to hmm. the to the fifteen hundred. And I thought that the suspension was going to feel a lot different, maybe. And it just um, I think there's still a little bit more that they need to do suspension wise, dampening in particular. Something just didn't exactly feel right for a truck that should really feel. Uh, I don't know, just more off-road, out of the box. So, did they get rid of the big ram? I think they did on the tailgate. Yeah, so that the, was ridiculous. The, that that was probably one of the things that I've really disliked that any manufacturer's done in a while. I mean, that really bugs me when I see those trucks driving down the road. That gigantic it's, ram on the back. I is remember so annoying. when they did. And that's it. going up. That the name imprints there are getting more popular, where car names on their backs are going down. Right. So now it's just got this little ram logo, and it looks like very Transformers esque. It's mm. actually pretty badass looking, and the one on the um, on the steering Easy. wheel. Easy. It looks it looks cool. <laughs> I, so remember, I'm, I remember. I remember when. Happy with what they did when they first and came out with that big ram on the tailgate i forget who said it and i wouldn't say a name anyway but they're like ram owners want to let you know what they're driving they want people want to see what kind of truck they're driving and i'm thinking like not that big <laughs> it's very obvious i mean the truck's driving. pretty big ram. that's just ridiculous <laughs> that reminds me of a rant i just thought of save it save it save it i plan to one more thing uh before we go on the ram uh i kind of feel sorry for it in a way um, you know, Ford has always been number one, and Chevy's been number two, and then Ram has been like way down in third. But the last Not couple anymore. years, the last couple of years, they're chipping away at that. They've even outsold Chevy a couple months here and there. And now that they've got an all new one, there's literally in a month there's a new Silverado. So yeah, and, well, and the F one fifty still beats it in towing. Yeah, so. so but they're also going to sell the outgoing Ram and the new Ram <clears throat> side by side for at least a year. They have a unspoken corporate goal of beating Silverado for during 2018 and become number two pickup truck. Yeah, I don't they, think. I mean, if it would have been interesting to see if there wasn't an all new Silverado yeah. right now as well. I think they probably could have done it, but I'm not sure now. It's gonna still be a race. I mean, the, you're absolutely right. I remember the days. It wasn't that long ago when Ram sales were five digits. They weren't that that big a deal. <laughs> Okay, we've got one more vehicle to talk about before we get on to um, our rant and raves and our viewer question. BMW X2. All right, everybody pretty much knows what the X1 is. They're uh, BMW's subcompact, uh, a mini-based five-door. We have one for a long term, which we really love. The X2 follows what the X4 is to the X3 and the X6 is to the X5. It's being a quote unquote more five door coupish version, although I think it um, doesn't quite get there. But they're claiming this is a sportier version of the X1. Ben, you went on the uh, print? Yeah, I did. What do you think? Uh, sportier indeed. Um, same platform, same drivetrain as the X1. It is three inches shorter due to uh, different overhangs mm-hmm. and three inches uh, uh, lower to the ground due to a different uh, roof line. But yeah, the roof line is sleeker. The um, what stood out to me was that the kidney grills are inverted, giving it a little more unique and edgy look to the front end, different than the X1. Um, and they're targeting um, uh, they're targeting Evoke buyers. So there it was rumored that there could potentially be a convertible version of this vehicle. Yikes. Somebody wow. somebody else is doing that a convertible another convertible SUV. I mean, there's like at least one other that was shown somewhere in Geneva or somewhere. Anyway, so that's interesting. Yeah, the pricing is pretty similar, um, and of course, fuel efficiency would still be similar. So, um, it's hard. Oh, to, are hard they to splitting hairs? What's going to be a, yeah, what's going to be a factor in one over the other? It's maybe uh, if you hate practicality, or, you would get the X2. If you yeah, like, if you want, to, if you want less action. luggage and, and yeah. less uh, headroom, then this is your car. How are the seats in that bad boy? <laughs> <laughs> They're exactly the same as the X1. It said legroom is pretty similar to the interior so, is really yeah. the same, isn't it? Between the two, it, there's there's small differences Pretty, in. Yeah. Uh, sh- there's more shoulder room for the rear passenger in the X2, 
and slightly less leg room here, so here in front of back. Just right. cut Real that close. onion really Even though the thin. number's bigger, the vehicle's smaller? Yeah, numerically. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Right. Here we go. Blows my mind, right? BMW. You can't make too much sense in your naming right. schemes. It's still difficult to get in the car with the, uh, I don't know about you guys, oh my but God. every time it's I so try bad. to get in the X1, that, on the B yeah, pillar. sometimes yeah. becomes uh, the invasive. The rear end area. <laughs> really? Yeah, you, yeah, never, you never had that problem? never smack the B pillar <laughs> with your back door? I must uh, <laughs> ingress into vehicles differently than you guys do. They, they, they jump <laughs> two feet first. You must do it You're with patience. Graceful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, BMW X2. Ground clearance to, uh, is the same on that. A BMW ne- dealer near you very soon. Uh, our viewer question will turn up oh, over the edge. Sorry, uh, Zach. Uh, one of the reasons Zach is here is that the he has uh, just yeah. tested an unusual Go, motorcycle, uh, the Alta dirt bike. And why don't you just take it from the top? What makes their bike special? All electric bikes. So pretty much, you know, we've driven, Brian, you've driven electric street bikes before. Uh, but this is a <clears throat> designated off-roader, so it's the MXR. You know, they've had the MX for the last couple years. Uh, it's getting better and better each year. Now they have the Redshift MXR. It's got 50 horsepower, which is 10 more than last year. Basically, they're just configuring things within the battery and the motors to basically be able to bring out more power, use less battery, and also uh, conduct less heat. So it just really piqued my interest as soon as I heard about it. And, you know, there's guys out there that are backflipping these things now, and they're just proving that it's really a dirt bike. So the more I heard about it, the more interested I became because my thought process was like everybody else on this, electric dirt bike. I don't think so. Are they backflipping it on purpose, or is it like On a, purpose, <laughs> It seems like with an electric bike, you might get into throttle and a little that, too that much. And that was the, the thing that scared me the most. I thought I was going to hop on it and just immediately loop it, mm. like worse than two-stroke or like the biggest, you know, gas bike they make. But um, it's very user-friendly. There's four different methods. Maps. So map one, for instance, is more uh, low traction, uh, technical wood stuff. And map four is just getting it on the track as hard as you can. It's basically compatible with a 350cc. 450 is pretty much the, the track standard. So it's not quite at 450 power just yet. But for me, this power was enough. So it's definitely impressive where this company's at. Very cool people, by the way. Can and- you- can you swap the battery out, or you just have to charge it? You can swap the battery out at the track, yeah. but they basically – the gist that I got from everybody was we're trying to stay away from that, you know, huh. bring a generator and charge the bike up. Some of you might be thinking, well, that kind of defeats yeah, the purpose exactly. of having an electric bike, right? <laughs> I don't think these guys are building these bikes to save the planet. I think they're building them because they legitimately see electric as the future, like that they're going to get more power out of these things, and they're just going to be a better bike than gas engines. Does that – tell you that electric bikes are starting to become the preferred bike for competition not the preferred bike yet and i mean if if you're trying to get guys in motocross to every all of a sudden believe that electric bikes are the way to go that's like telling truck you know guys that drive v8 trucks that uh prius is it you know that that, 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 that the the prius is what you want to take to the farm man so uh i mean it's going to take a long time but i mean but I'm, you obviously liked it, I was and you so liked it a lot. On the thing. I mean, I was so super impressed by is, it. Is it because it was instantaneous power? It's I mean, the what was instantaneous it? power. Um, it weighs about thirty more pounds more than a four fifty. Huh. But I just I love the way that the throttle came through. You do kind of have to kind of keep your momentum up more than saying a four fifty. You can kind of come up and just give it the business at the jump. You kind of want to really focus on on keeping up your momentum. But I don't know why. I just felt very comfortable in it. After my first lap, I was in the third map. So I just started. And then at the end of the day, I was in map four. And then when I finished, I had about a quarter of the battery life left. And my body just had enough. There's a point where you almost make a couple mistakes. And you got to get your butt off the track before you get hurt. I hit that point, and I had a quarter of my battery life left still. So, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. Is it belt drive or chain? Uh, Chain. Yeah, it's, did the lack of noise? I mean, is there any noise at all? Or what you hear is chain, chain slap. Yeah. You hear the dirt hitting the bike. You hear the um, the tire basically scrubbing the dirt. Um, you hear it trying to get traction. So I think that's another thing that I really liked about it so much is that because it is quiet, you can ride where you can't ride dirt bikes. Yesterday, I had this mm. dude come out and scream at me again for riding my dirt bike. <laughs> in and his all, front yard. All, yeah, I was literally, all I was literally <laughs> doing was loading it in, into my truck, and he came out and flipped out. 
But, um, I mean, that would just put an end to that stuff. You know, you can build a dirt bike track in the middle of the city now. So, I mean, there's just so many positives to this thing. And, you know, with the technology only getting better. Um, but you know, range wasn't an issue because you're not – this is not really an endurance bike. Range will – range is an issue for some people because, let's say – so there's basically uh, three different types of bikes. They make uh, on- and off-roaders, enduros. They make um, strictly street bikes. They make strictly track bikes. So with the strictly track bike, a pro is going to get about an hour or a half an hour ride time. And whereas for me, if I were to take this thing to the track, like I said, I saw it a quarter or left. But if you take the EX, which is their um, do it all, or uh, you can get three to four hours on the trails. That seems like uh, the, you've tested a number of electric bikes over the last, I don't know, 10 years. That seems like more range than what you had found up until recently. Yeah, battery yeah. technology has been escalating rapidly. I mean, the last time I drove one, they've, they've gotten much better since then. So. so just like cars, yeah. solving the range anxiety Yeah, and the torque issue. was the coolest thing about this bike, by the way. I think it was 107, 147 pound-feet. That's a lot, actually. That's more than yeah. – yeah. I mean, yeah. it's incredible. So, I mean, uh, in the next couple of years, I mean, these things are just going to be insane. Thank you, sir. The Ultra Dirt Bikes. Uh, viewer question, Jana via email says, Okay, I've always driven a car with a manual transmission. Good for you, Jana. Typically, I get far better gas mileage than cars with automatics. I'm in the market for a new car. And not only is it very difficult to find a manual transmission, but when I do, the gas mileage is three to five miles per gallon less than the automatic. What causes this difference, and when did that happen? Anybody want to start? Uh, Recently, I would say the last uh, eight, ten years, that's been the case. More gears. Yeah. In the transmission, and just a lot of development money getting put into making them more efficient. Electronic clutches and so forth. Manuals so are kind of old <clears throat> technology at this point. They're not dumping a lot of money into making them better because pretty much everything's going to be automatic at some yeah, point. It's like 4% of the market. It peaks up around 6 or 7 once in a while. The uh, To give you some um, uh, numbers, I looked up a Toyota Corolla. Uh, the uh, combined uh, fuel economy rating for Corolla manual is 30. For the automatic is 31. And Audi, which still offers quite a few manuals, it's basically the same now between the automatic and the manual for combined city highways. So the automatics have gotten better, dual clutches, um, CVTs, CVTs, all of that. Yeah. So, Jan, I think you're going to have a much, much harder time finding yourself a manual transmission car. And frankly, what I, if you, the only way to retain some of that... Um, <clears throat> Enjoyment is to look for an automatic that's got some kind of a manual shift capabilities. Although I think you find you'll find once you use that a couple of times, you'll probably never use it. And one with real gears, not and a CVT. We, no yeah. CVTs, please. Real Just gears. Buy a Porsche it's PK, you'll be happy. You, like if you if you break it down and try to think of what it's like to try and sell somebody on a manual transmission in today's age, like we got this great technology. <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of fun. You get to do more stuff in the car. You have to shift the gears for yourself. <laughs> and you it's use a little, both feet. It's not as smooth. There's more it's wear not and as tear. A, it's not as efficient. There's more wear and tear. There's noise. But you have a good time. It's a little bit harder, but, yeah, it's fun. It's so fun don't on, get the automatic. It's fun on hills when people are six inches off your rear bumper. <laughs> you need two arms to drive it. <laughs> so anyway, Jana, uh, with that little bit of editorial aside, good luck in your car search. So, uh, Ben, you said you had a rant and rave. I do. Shoot. Uh, you know, it wasn't that. I'm going to change it into uh, <laughs> something, a some, something of intrigue, actually. Something, something, something of that's interest, been on my mind. Intrigue. I was wondering what kind of car you took your driver's test on. And <laughs> oh, that's a cool Out of all idea. the cars you've owned, the, most, the one that's last, most lasting in your mind and what you liked and disliked about that particular car. So this is an interview. This is not a rant and rave. Yeah, also, I, 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 I was going to have a rant, Excuse but I, I decided to change <laughs> right. my mind. Well... I learned to drive back in the dark ages in a – it was probably a 1963 or 4 Oldsmobile 88. So it was not the biggest boat you could buy, but it was almost the biggest boat you could buy. And my dad – it's my dad's car, and we went out and did the uh, driver's test, and you had to parallel park it, and I managed to parallel park this this barge. And they would uh, – the actual driving course was on a one-lane road through a cemetery. 
that was adjacent to the highway control, patrol <laughs> office so that the instructor never had to go very far. You always failed the first time you took it. That was like a given, so it took you two times to pass. But that wasn't memorable. Um, when we took the test, it was starting to rain, and I passed the test. On the way home, I locked up the brakes at a stoplight. And I hit somebody in the rear. <laughs> I didn't hit the mark, but, you know, enough to crumple up the bumper. Up. So I managed to have my first accident on the way home from getting my driver's test. And the rest, as they say, is history. Wow. Wow. And that's probably why they did the driver's test in the cemeteries, because right. at that time, if you got into a car, you are probably going to die. <laughs> well, the, you know, you had bias ply tires. They had no traction on wet. Optional belts. Uh, you had... Um, you know, really crummy brakes. I don't think that car had front disc brakes. I don't remember, but all I remember was locking them up and sliding. And I wasn't going that's, fast. That's I was probably right, going man. about five miles an hour. And in those days, the bumpers were so big and chrome. Even the car we hit, I don't think it did any damage to it, but, you know, it, it shook everybody up. Mm. And uh, no police were called. We went about our way. My dad gave him his – my dad was very disgusted and gave his uh, – <laughs> our address, and I'm not sure whatever happened. You're supposed that. to call the police in that situation, John. I know you are. But, <laughs> uh, my, dad, uh, my dad didn't, and who am I? I was just a kid. Would you, you have done it when you got home because there was no cell phones. Uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That there my head there too. were barely, barely phones uh, that you could put I money in. I felt so young and stupid. Uh, the car that I, uh, if you really care, the car that I, uh, I guess I remember the most and wish I still owned was my 1973 D. Tommaso Pantera, which I bought used from a guy in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. His parents bought it for him. He wrecked it. They shipped him out to the Navy, had the car six, fixed, and sold it. Wow. And I say had the car fixed because they barely had the car fixed. It, was in, it, it looked good on the outside. It was a cream puff, but had a lot of problems inside. I love the car. It was uh, you know, an Italian exotic with a Mustang engine in it, and it was one of Lee Iacocca's ideas. And um, what I didn't like about it, I guess, was that you had to lay under it every weekend to fix something. Uh, that, not the engine. The engine was fine. It was a Ford engine. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I often wonder. I never kept the VIN, which is too bad. I'd love to trace it and see if it's still around. It probably is. What color was that? It was white with red with blue racing stripes. Nice. It, was a, it had that kind of pseudo uh, Ford GT uh, color scheme to it. It, had a black, it did have a black stripe along the uh, rocker panels. Black interior? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I think, that's all, I think they were all black in those days. And you sat, you know, three inches in front of the engine. It was very loud. Um, and it would overheat every time, you know, the, it got warm, but it was still fun. It was a cool-looking car. They look cool cruising down the road. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen them on the road once or twice, and they're really hard to miss. Uh, they, they were an inter- – you know, we drive a lot of exotic cars here in the show. And the thing that always strikes me when we get into a McLaren or just about anything – is that you're often laying back and looking at the sky. You don't really see the road. Well, for whatever reason, the Di Tommaso Pantera, you sat very upright and you looked down over the nose. So you actually saw where you were going very, very well. However, your passenger would usually get car sick because the road would look would be mm. rushing up uh, against them. So my wife told me about 10 years later. <laughs> That's an interesting question. What was the most memorable car you've ever had? We'll, ra- we'll oh, wrap up looks today's like show with that. Time. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Come on, Brian. <laughs> what, well, was the, what was the single most memorable car? Probably my had? first car, man. V6 Toyota Avalon. The front tires were so bald because I'd pack people in that thing and just come out of a turn and just mash the gas. Smoke would come barreling away, leaving school and stuff. So It's yeah, a wonder you're rolled. still with us, but we're glad you are. I appreciate that. <laughs> Benny? I've had so many. I don't think I could narrow it down. Oh, come on! You can't think. You of can't think of your one year, year old. Didn't you have a CJ? I did have a the. I had a '66 Skylark. Ah, that was a GS clone, oh, and it cool. had um, it had Regal T type turbo wheels on it. Mm-hmm. It was a gorgeous car. It was burgundy with a GS red pinstripe and a black interior. Bench seat, two speed automatic with a. It was a 310 Wildcat, and it was in high schools. And it had the huge Buick turbo rubber all mm-hmm. over it. It's an amazing car, and it sounded great, but it was slow, but it was cool. <laughs> but it looked cool. <laughs> Greg? Yeah, first car was a 92 Camry, and I remember yeah, the man. day my dad brought it home for his, like, the family car. I was so excited, and then 
you know, 12, 13 years later. You got it. I got it. It wasn't as exciting then. But that, that, it was, that thing it was, was freedom. That thing was so – we finally got rid of it maybe about a year ago. A year ago, we just gave it away. We sold it for whatever. I don't know what he sold it for. But uh, I think it just – more like one of those Toyotas. It just kept running. You take care of it a little bit, throw on some spark plug wires every once in a while. I replaced the distributor cap. Honestly, that's about it. We had a, a couple of motor mount problems. Um, and But other than that, I mean, it started up every morning. And I got to school, unfortunately. Brian Robinson? I had an 80, uh, 1980 vet. I, I was unfortunately, so. it was a show vet. <laughs> And uh, uh, it came, it came the with the auxiliary. Uh, it came with auxiliary braking. Like if when the, the uh, drum brakes were fading, you could just switch on the AC and everything would grind to a halt. Didn't you have a Corvette for like a couple of days? Sorry. That's a story for another day. Oh come on, that was a story. <laughs> I don't want you to tell. All right, that wraps up our Motor Week Podcast 178. To say we got a little bit off subject matter today is an understatement. Thanks, everybody, around the table. Brian Robinson, Ben Davis, Greg Carlos, Zach Maskell for, for a lively program. Joe Ligo back there manning our uh, camera that's beeping uh, for our – Ah, that's okay. Told you we were out of time. And uh, Jim Bigwood, our audio engineer, who keeps us sounding crisp and clear, and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. To all of you out there that have been fans of Motor Week over the years, thank you very much for watching. If you are still wondering where to watch us on your local public television station or on Velocity, we have a new feature on our website at motorweek.org that now gives you much more accurate listings than ever before. Pull down the menu from up top. Uh, and uh, take a, put in your zip code, and it'll pop up and tell you every place you can find us. Till next time, I'm John Davis. For all of us at Motor Week, thanks for watching and listening to Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, Hum by Verizon, RockAuto.com. State Farm, and Autotempest.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.